Good evening. I am Xavier Solomon, the Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection. Welcome to this evening's episode of Cocktails with a Curator. Uh, we've had many celebrations in the past two weeks, but this week, uh, the 5th of January, is also National Bird Day. And this is a, a, an international uh, holiday which was uh, created in 2002 uh, to draw attention to the plight of birds in their natural habitats, but also in, in cities like New York, and the disappearance of many uh, species of birds, um, which is something that is happening worldwide. And of course, uh, it's something uh, worrying. And, um, and so because of this uh, International Day, I thought I would talk today about uh, one, uh, well, a couple of objects at the Frick, which relate to the so-called Swan Service. Uh, this is a spice box that came to the Frick from the collection of Henry Arnhold. And I've spoken previously about his great collection of mice and porcelain and how it came to the Frick uh, and some of the highlights uh, from it. Uh, I find porcelain a fascinating material. And so uh, I'm very happy to talk about porcelain again and talk about the service, which takes its name from the decoration uh, on most of the dishes and most of the pieces. Uh, which represents always two swans. Uh, in fact, there are also um, two herons. You see one heron on the left here with a fish in its beak, and there's usually another one flying above. Uh, and um, But because of the swans, and we'll see for a number of other reasons, this has always been known as the swan service. And we also have another piece from the service, which is this tall cup and saucer. Because of this, uh, tonight's cocktail is not quite a cocktail, but it gives me the opportunity to drink from my own Swan Service cup. Um, the, the Swan Service is still produced in Meissen and you can buy your own pieces, either entirely white, like the one I have, or painted with flowers and, and, and gold decoration. Um, so what I'm drinking from this is a spiked hot chocolate. These sort of cups were invented in the 18th century to hold drinks such as chocolate, coffee, or tea, which came from exotic parts of the world, from Asia, uh, Africa, and America. Uh, this spiked hot chocolate is mixed up with rum. Cheers. The story, of course, of the Meissen Manufactory, as I've discussed before, uh, starts in the early 18th century between Dresden and Meissen in Saxony. And of course, the great hero of the story is uh, the king, Augustus II, Augustus the Strong, who was um, elector of Saxony and uh, king of Poland. And under his uh, rule, um, porcelain is invented in Dresden and then soon after uh, the manufacturer is brought to the uh, castle of Meissen. Of course, porcelain existed for a long time before uh, in China and Japan, and it was imported into Europe all the way back to the Middle Ages. But it is really under Augustus the Strong that Europe starts producing uh, porcelain and in invents, discovers uh, the way to do so. Today's story, however, uh, is from a few decades later, and we move into the 1730s, and we move um, through the story of porcelain to the successor of Augustus the Strong. Of course, the first two great figures in the Meissen manufactory, and, and I've talked about them before, uh, were Butger, and uh, of course, he is the inventor of porcelain, and this is a wonderful teapot in the so-called Butger ware that we have at the Frick from the Arnhold collection, and um, Kirchner, who was the first great sculptor at Meissen, who produces the early animals for the menagerie of Augustus the Strong. And this is the great bastard uh, at the Frick by Kirchner. But as I say, we move to the next generation. We move to the next generation of artists and the next generation of rulers. And we're talking about Augustus III. Augustus III was Augustus II's son. Uh, also Elector of Saxony and King of Poland. Here you see him in this beautiful uh, pa painting portrait by Pietro Rotari, who was uh, a, a painter from Verona, from Italy, who traveled to the court of Saxony. And Augustus III uh, becomes king in 1734. 
but not without um, some issues. The kings of Poland were elective kings. Uh, they were elected by the aristocracy of the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania. And even though on occasions this became a dynastic succession, uh, the king always had to be voted. And between 1733 and 1734, and a few years beyond that, uh, the war of Polish succession begins. Because even though the intention is for the Saxon elector, for Augustus III, to become king, um, the King of France, Louis XV, wants to put another person on the throne of Poland. And this person is um, Stanisław Lichinski, who had been King Stanisław I previously, uh, at the time of Augustus II. There had been a moment where uh, Lichinski was, was, made, um, was made King of Poland. But then, of course, Augustus II uh, becomes the king, uh, remains on the throne. And so Louis XV tries to put Lichinski back on the throne of Poland, partly because his daughter, Maria Lichinska, at this point is the Queen of France, is married to Louis XV. So the dynastic um, combinations between these various families uh, create this war. And of course, while the French are trying to put Stanisław on the throne of Poland again for the second time in 1733, uh, Russia and other countries uh, rather have uh, Augustus III. And of course, in the end, Augustus III is the one that is elected and crowned um, King of Poland. He's crowned in Kraków on the 17th of January, 1734. So the anniversary of the coronation of Augustus also is coming up uh, this month. And for this coronation, uh, which is a grand and splendid affair, this is the crown that is made for Augustus III, which is still in, in Warsaw today, in Poland, um, which is the crown with which uh, he is uh, officially made um, King of Poland. Some of the regalia are divided between Warsaw and Dresden. Uh, but for this for this ceremony, Meissen produces a service of dishes. And of course, we're all used to the idea of having ceramic and porcelain dishes in our own homes. But you have to think that at this point in the 18th century would have been incredibly rare and incredibly expensive to be able to do so. So this service, the so-called coronation service, is produced between 1733 and 34 for the coronation of Augustus III. We have one of the dishes from the service, also from the Arnhold collection at the Frick. And there were 17 seven pieces produced for this service, which has at the center in the middle of this decoration with um, small flowers copied from uh, Asian prototypes and gold decoration around the border. But the central coat of arms is, of course, the coat of arms of Augustus III, the crown of his kingdom. And below it, at the very center, you see the coat of arms of the Vettine family of Saxony with the um, cross swords, which also will become the symbol of Meissen, and the courted um, arms of the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania, the white eagle for Poland, the knight on horseback for Lithuania. Now, this service was so precious and so incredible that it was not actually used at the coronation. What happened is that it was displayed on a dresser, on a sideboard, um, and shown at the coronation while people, guests, the hundreds of guests who were there, uh, ate on silver dishes. And then soon after, the service was delivered to the Japanese palace in Dresden, where it was kept. The service I'm talking about today, the Swan Service, instead was made for, for this man, the, the main minister, the prime minister of, uh, of Augustus III, Heinrich von Brühl, who was born in 1700 and died in 1763. Brühl was one of the great patrons of the age. Uh, he was one of the most powerful people in Central Europe, in Europe in general, in the Western world. Um, he had become important under Augustus II. He had uh, got into the king's confidence and he was in Warsaw in 1733 when Augustus II dies. And supposedly he is the man who makes sure that the most important belongings of Augustus II, the most precious belongings he had with him in Warsaw are delivered back to the court in Dresden. Of course, there is the uncertainty that Augustus III will become king. And so um, Augustus III is incredibly grateful for Brühl to bring these objects back to Dresden. But more importantly, Brühl is the man who gets the fundraising going and the power discussions going to make sure that Augustus III is elected by the aristocracy of Poland and Lithuania as the new king. So Augustus III owes a lot to Brühl and becomes entirely 
um, reliant on him. And Brühl becomes the most powerful man at court. Uh, he runs most of the business between Saxony and, um, and Poland. He spends his life between the two capitals, uh, between Dresden, and of course here you see one of the wonderful uh, Bernardo Bellotto views of Dresden. Bellotto, of course, was in both um, Dresden and Warsaw at the time, doing beautiful um, cityscapes of both cities. And Brühl lived uh, in a wonderful palace in this area of the city, along the Elbe River. Here you see two of the main churches and the bridge connecting the old to the new town. And just behind these churches, you can't quite see it, was the residence, the, the main um, palace of the Elector of Saxony. But along this waterfront, uh, Brühl built his palace, along what is now known as Brühl Terrace. And this was a terrace built along the Elbe River in front of the Brühl Palace, uh, which has become the main promenade of, uh, of Dresden. Brühl also built a palace in Warsaw. Unfortunately, both of these buildings don't exist anymore. The Brühl Palace in Dresden was destroyed in 1900, so the terrace survives, but not the actual palace. And while in Warsaw, um, here you see another Bellotto view of, of uh, the, the city of Warsaw along the Vistula River on the left. And on the right, of course, the first building you see is the Royal Palace. And not far away from the Royal Palace, next to another royal residence known as the Saxon Palace and the Saxon Gardens, um, Brühl built this palace, the Brühl Palace in, in Warsaw, uh, with these wonderful spiked, um, almost Chinese uh, roofs. And this was, again, one of the grander palaces in the city in Warsaw. And unfortunately, this was entirely destroyed during the war. Uh, nothing of it survives. Uh, it was raised to the ground. And even though there have been plans recently to rebuild it on, on its location and the nearby Saxon palace as well, uh, this has not happened yet. Uh, the story today of Brühl, of his collection, of especially the Swan Service, will be a story of creation, but also a story in many ways of destruction. And of course, both Dresden and Warsaw were two of the most beautiful cities in Central Eastern Europe uh, that were altogether destroyed during the war. Brühl was uh, a great collector. And he had a great collection of paintings, of drawings, a very important library. He was very keen on all luxurious goods. Um, he, we know that he had an incredible collection of outfits, of shoes, of watches. Uh, he was a, a, a compulsive um, purchaser. He, he bought lots of works of art, commissioned many things. And just to give you an idea, uh, part of his collection of paintings and most of his drawings were eventually acquired by Catherine the Great, and they became the cornerstone of uh, the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg as we know it. So the Swan Service was made uh, for Brühl uh, between 1737 and 1741. Brühl was, um, apart from being Minister of Saxony and Poland, was the supervisor of the Meissen factory from 1733 and became its overall director in 1739. The, the service was created by the third great artist at the Meissen manufactory, Johann Joachim Kindler. And Kindler took over from Kirchner and he became the sculptor responsible for many of the menagerie animals, porcelain menagerie animals uh, of Augustus the Strong, and subsequently under Augustus III produced many other pieces at Meissen. He envisioned the design of these dishes, of this service, uh, together with two other workers at the, at the manufactory, Johann Friedrich Eberlein and Johann Gottlieb uh, Eder. And the three of them are really the artists behind this incredible work of art. So what does the Swan Service look like and why is it called the Swan Service? Here is one of the main dishes of the, of the service and here you see the basic design. It's white porcelain. Uh, the background of the dish is um, shell-like. It's been suggested that in many ways the surface of these dishes were to echo the subject represented on them. And so everything has an aquatic uh, iconography and aquatic symbolism. Uh, there is a sort of shell-like background, sometimes there's even the background of feathers, of swan's feathers. We've discussed how there are the two swans, the two herons, in, um, in a marshy land surrounded by bulrushes. And this is because the, the, the surname of the patron of Brühl in German means a marshy land, a marshy area. So the, the, the iconography of the service is directly related to 
uh, Brew's name. Uh, the service is then gilt in part and decorated with what were known as Indian flowers, these little flowers that were very much part of the early Mycenae uh, decoration of, of many of the pieces. The coat of arms of Brühl appears on every individual piece. And this is important because uh, after the service was produced, Meissen kept the molds. They still exist in the Meissen manufactory and they still to this day produce plates and objects from uh, the Swan service. Of course, the original Swan service is the one with the coat of arms of Brühl. And that's how we can tell the difference from pieces that were made for other patrons or later on. The service was uh, not directly commissioned by Brühl. Brühl, as, as the supervisor and director of Meissen, had the right to have porcelain made for him personally at the manufactory. But this service was a gift, supposedly, from the king, from Augustus III, to Brühl on the occasion of his, um, of his wedding. In November of 1737, uh, Brühl married a bohemian aristocrat, Franziska Kolovrat Krakowski, and for the wedding, uh, the service was produced. The service was actually used at the, at the wedding. And this, of course, is interesting as a difference from the coronation of the king a few years earlier, where the service was not used, uh, but also was a much larger service. The service for the coronation was 77 pieces. The service for Brühl was 2,200 pieces. This was a vast service. And the service um, was comprised of pieces of very different shapes, forms, and use. Just to give you an idea, at a regular banquet at the Brühl Palace, where he would entertain politicians and, and, and powerful people from other courts or from the courts of Saxony and Poland, Brühl served between 80 and 100 courses of different food at a meal. And of course, these banquets lasted for hours and were the show of power and the importance of the host. So here is, for example, one of these wonderful um, trays um, with a sort of wonderful shape. And in many instances, the, the parts of the, of the Brühl service, of the Swan service, have other references to the aquatic world of one kind or another. And um, Kendler was supposed to have studied these elements at the natural history um, collection at uh, in Dresden. Uh, he also based some of it on engravings. And so, for example, the swans and the herons are actually copied from two different prints um, from the time. Uh, here is the tall cup and saucer uh, from the Frick collection. Uh, and this is to remind you that pieces of a service like this were not just dishes, but there were all sorts of different cups and, and implements and, and different, uh, different uh, uh, sort of objects for different use. Uh, so the spice box, for example, at the Frick with this wonderful um, shell shape was a box for spices that was used as part of the centerpiece uh, of the service. And there were many of these boxes as part of it. And of course, precious spices, oriental spices would have been kept in them uh, together with then salt cellars for salt and, and pepper boxes. Uh, the service was incredibly uh, opulent. And here I'm just showing you one of the many terrines, which shows the goddess of water, uh, Neptune's wife, Amphitritis, at the top uh, with a dolphin and a, and a putto, and, 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 and well, Cupid, wing, wing, wing putto. Uh, and this was also copied from a painting by the Bolognese 17th century painter Francesco Albani. The more pieces you see together, the more you realize how uh, important and luxurious this uh, service was. And here I'm showing you some of the dishes, a spoon, uh, a coffee pot. The largest group of objects from the Swan service is kept at the National Museum in Warsaw in Poland. The service was actually dispersed and uh, it belonged to the Brühl family and pieces of it were given away uh, during different generations of the family. And um, out of the 2,200 pieces, probably only about 100 survive today between private collections and public uh, institutions and museums. Uh, we don't know exactly how many survive because an inventory of the surviving pieces has never been done or attempted. So it's something that hopefully someone will do in the future. And it would be great to see all of these pieces brought together and the story of the service brought together in a book or an exhibition. Um, 
Warsaw has the largest group. They have between 50 and 60 uh, pieces out of the 100. Uh, the other great collections for the Swan Service are the museums in Dresden, of course, the Porcelain Museum in Dresden, uh, Berlin, and uh, Cleveland in the United States. And so we're very lucky out of these 100 pieces to have two at the Frick. Now, the service originally was in um, the palace in Dresden, but after the wedding in 1737, it was moved to, um, to this castle, which belonged to, uh, to Brühl as well. This was uh, Schloss Furten, now uh, known as Brode. Uh, it used to be on the Prussian-German side of the border. It's now very close to the border, but it's now Polish territory since the Second World War, hence the change in name from Furten to Brode. And this was more or less on the journey between Warsaw and Dresden. Uh, so it was a place where Brühl could stop uh, along the way. Uh, it's closer to, uh, as I say, to the German border and to Dresden than it is to Warsaw. And this was a grand uh, schloss where the Brühl family kept the Swan service uh, for, uh, for, for the period between its creation and the Second World War. Now, the, the, the Schloss in Brode uh, survived all the way until the Second War. And here again, it's a terrible history of, uh, of destruction. When the Soviet army, the Red Army, reached this area coming uh, towards Germany, uh, the Schloss was, was basically destroyed. The interior was, uh, was burned. And um, here you see it as it appears today. The roof has been somewhat restored, but the interior is uh, altogether abandoned and empty. The Swan Service was still there, what remained of it. It's been guessed that about half of it at that point had survived at Furten, and um, this was altogether destroyed by the Red Army. And the stories of the destruction of the, of the Swan Service are particularly harrowing. Uh, some of the pieces were used to feed animals, uh, but more horribly, uh, dishes were used uh, as shooting targets, uh, clay pigeon, they, they were thrown in the air and shot. And there are these unbelievable uh, accounts by people living in, in, in Brode of seeing the, the Russians driving tractors in fields covered with the, with the Swan Service and just smashing it with their tractors over it. And until recent times, uh, people in the area of Brode would still find shards, pieces of the Swan Service in the fields uh, around the castle. Um, so this incredible object, this incredible work of art, the greatest Meissen service ever produced, um, came to an end almost altogether in the, in the mid 1940s at the, at the time of the war. And we're lucky that, as I say, about a hundred pieces survive. And for us, it's especially uh, lucky that we have two pieces uh, from this one service, this incredibly important service. And between the dish of the coronation service and the spice box and the cup and saucer uh, from this one service, we can tell the stories of these uh, unbelievably important services uh, at the Frick. I would like to conclude uh, by reading a poem. And this is um, not directly related, as far as we know, to the Swan Service, but somewhat inspired or connected to its destruction in the war. This is a very famous poem by the Polish uh, writer uh, Czesław Miłosz, uh, one of the greatest uh, poets of the 20th century in Poland. And he wrote this in 1947 when he was in exile from Poland in Washington, DC. And this is a meditation, and I have an incredibly beautiful meditation on uh, the fragility of art objects, the fragility of humankind, uh, the damage of war. And in many ways, it echoes what happened in Brode uh, with the Swan Service. Uh, the poem is entitled Song on Porcelain. And Miwash writes, Rose colored cup and saucer, flowery demitasses, you lie beside the river where an armored column passes. Winds from across the meadow sprinkle the banks with down. A torn apple tree's shadow falls on the muddy path. The ground everywhere is strewn with bits of brittle froth. Of all things broken and lost, porcelain troubles me most. Before the first red tones begin to warm the sky, the earth wakes up and moans. It is the small sad cry of cups and saucers cracking, the master's precious dream of roses, of mowers raking and shepherds on the lawn. 
the black underground stream swallows the frozen swan. This morning, as I walked past, the porcelain troubled me most. The blackened plain spreads out to where the horizon blurs in a litter of handle and spout, a lively pulp that stirs and crunches under my feet. Pretty useless foam. Your stained colors are sweet, splattered in dirty waves, flecking the fresh black loam in the mounds of these new graves. In sorrow and pain and cost, sir, porcelain troubles me most. It's a very beautiful poem and of course, in so many ways, it reflects on what happened, of course, in Poland, in, in Germany, um, but also what happens in this specific case uh, to this service. Thank you for joining me this evening, and I look forward to welcoming you all to another episode of Cocktails with the Curator.